Bible study. I have just a few announcements. Uh, hey, did you guys like our homecoming this uh, past Sunday? Wasn't that about pretty, some good stuff right there? Amen. Man, oh man. Even even some of the transition guys came out. That's pretty cool, man. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, and yes, CLM is with us tonight, everybody. Look at those nice people right there. Amen. Very cool. And the transition house. And I don't know how many of y'all know this guy, but uh, this guy, his name is James Ripple. He went through the ministry years ago, and he helps uh, lead the transition house. He's with us tonight. He's that dour-looking guy back there, right there, man. And like, uh, man, I'll tell you what. If you can make him smile, you've done a good thing. Amen. <laughs> uh, but he don't smile, but his heart is very amazing. So uh, if you would uh, pray for him and everyone involved in that ministry. I do want to let you guys know that we will be having a equipping session for all of our servants and leaders this coming Monday night at 7 p.m. So if you are in any of our ministries out here, we want you there for that to talk about uh, some upcoming ministry uh, opportunities that, that God's going to give us. And also, uh, we're pray prayerfully, we will have some type of fall festival at the end of, of October, fall fest or we're definitely going to do a trunk retreat, but we're, we're trying to figure out how uh, we, we might can do a fall fest like we've done in previous years. So if you would keep that in your prayers. Also, uh, I want to or, or remind everybody that we are still doing Operation Ch uh, Christmas Child, and we are prayerfully going to uh, attempt to have 100 shoe boxes sent out. Uh, and these shoe boxes, they're Christmas for a child somewhere around the world. Uh, in most cases, it's children who will never hear about or receive the gospel. And that is one of the most crucial things that we place in that box is a, a Bible in their own language. And so uh, we're, our, we're prayerfully going to approach that. On October 18th, the morning, uh, we're going to have a, a short presentation on uh, little things that we can do as a congregation to help make that happen. Uh, also, October 21st, which is a Wednesday, I want you all to be in prayer for this. October 21st is a day of prayer. And uh, how we are going to participate in that is at, at noon here, right here in the sanctuary, if God would lead you. But we're going to do about six hours of prayer and fasting. And whoever would like to participate in that, every hour we're going to have someone read scripture and then pray. And we'll do that every hour until 6.30 and we'll have some praise and worship that night, and then we'll do Bible study at 7 and see what God reveals to us. And I'd really be interested to see what chapter of Revelation we're on that night. Amen. <laughs> uh, very uh, interested in that. Uh, but uh, please lift that up. That's October 21st, uh, Wednesday, and we'll start right here at noon. Uh, the youth have youth day this coming Saturday. Uh, the guys are going paintballing. And the girls are going to go to a spa, I think. And so if any of you know some youth who might want to, you know, do those things. Now, uh, I, you know, I would, that, 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 uh, that, hey man, that paintballing, that's some fun stuff, you know, that is. Mark, you might want to do that, man. You know, you and, you and Rick, that'd be good, you know. Um, but pray for them as they do that. Um, and I have one more thing to ask uh, of any, any of the men here who is able. Uh, we have a need in our community. And tomorrow, uh, about 930, we're going to meet here at the church and go to uh, a young lady's house and do some repairs. And so any guys who can uh, be around uh, for a few hours tomorrow, uh, just come and meet with me like right after church uh, or just show up tomorrow morning right there at 930. And uh, it's not, not a lot, but uh, we definitely want to, you know, love on this family. So uh, if y'all would uh, meet with me or come on out, you know, uh, some of y'all are very skilled men. You know, I'm only skilled in the Bible and the buffet. That's it. <laughs> so I'm going to go over there to work, and I might, like, mess things up if you're not there. Amen. So uh, please come on out and help us out. Uh, is there anything we'd like to lift up for prayer or praise tonight? We um, definitely want to pray for. Yes, uh, continue to lift up Brother Marty Brinson. Uh, who else would like to pray for tonight? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. That's right. You all lift up Jody Bowers and uh, Sister Kathy as they travel. 
Oh yeah, yes ma'am. We'll lift up um, Barbara Gaskins. Oh, Barbara Wins. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Drew Gray, is that correct? Um, well, let's see. Amen. Y'all, y'all lift up Dawn. Amen. Yes, sir. Well, we're praying for you, Bubba. We love you. Um, anything else? We want? Uh, Audrey. Aubrey. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I bet she'd claim him. You know, uh, but we'll lift her up. Regard. You know, we'll pray for Danny too. You want me to do that? We pray for Danny. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what else? Uh, anything else you want to lift up? Pray for. Oh yeah, y'all continue to lift up Terry. She took a fall yesterday, but she's she's doing good. She's a little bruised up, but I'll just lift her up. Um, Anything else? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, y'all lift up Brother Hans. Amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you got some surgery Friday, and so y'all, y'all lift him up. Amen. Would you like us to lay some hands on you later, Hans? With prayer, right? And uh, that's uh, <laughs> He's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> amen. And uh, we love you, man, and we are praying for you. Um, uh, anything else? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I, I love you. I love all of you. Amen. Even Danny. Amen. And uh, that's, I, <laughs> I said it just like he would say it. Amen. And uh, but uh, no, I'm I'm truly blessed. You know. Um, but yeah, th- I just I'm just doing what I'm supposed to. Amen. And uh, if we would all do what we're supposed to, it'd be a much better place. Amen. Um, uh, y- yes, ma'am. Amen. Very good. We'll continue to lift you up, Miss Deb. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We'll pray for safe journeys. And you can bring her home and uh, tell her that she has a whole church family here who's going to love and pray for her when she gets here. So, um, yes, sir. Wow. 
Oh, man. Uh, God's done a, a pretty big work in your life, hasn't he, Joe? Amen. Um, it's amazing. But um, I'm keeping you in prayer, man. Uh, praise God. Uh, well, uh, yes, sir. That's right. Amen. Hey, buddy. Hey, man. Uh, Dustin, welcome to our family. Amen. Uh, praise God. I, I, I think that if angels can make a shout, I think we should get allowed too. Amen. And, uh, so praise God, man. Welcome to our family. And we'll pray for you, Dustin. Uh, yes, ma'am. Are y'all having a baptism service or anything like that? Or? Uh, no, no, ma'am, not yet. Oh, what? Oh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. We pray, man. Love you guys. And Joel, you're graduating, is that correct? Well, man, we're going to guard you in prayer, brother. You know, love you, man. Uh, anything else you want to pray for with stuff? Uh, well, church, that is a lot to pray for. Amen. But God's sufficient, isn't he? Amen. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good. There is none like you. You are sufficient for every need we have. God, if, if we say that we have nothing, Lord, but we have you, we have everything. God, that you would just be with each request mentioned tonight. Lord, I want to lift up a dear sister, Miss Charlene Alderman. God, that you would continue to be with her, give her health. God, that you would touch her heart. Uh, Father, I want to lift up Brother Don to you, Lord, as he's facing cancer treatment. God, that you might pull him through every one of those. And Lord, that he might stand at the end of that cancer treatment, cancer-free. Father, I lift up Brother Marty Branson, Lord, and I pray for a sweet wife, Lord, that you might continue to be with them, guide them, lead them. Lord, give my brother Marty healing, and God, give him peace of body, mind, and soul. Lord, I lift up uh, Sister Jody Bowers and her mother Kathy as they travel. Lord, give them safe journeys. Lord, we continue to lift up Barbara, Lord, that you would just be with her. Uh, God, we lift up Drew Gray. Father, I pray that you would free him from the chains of addiction. And God, that you would break him out of the circle that he's in. And Lord, give him a brand new life. Father, I ask that his heart would just uh, be broken before you, Lord, that he might receive you into himself. God, I lift up and continue to pray for all of CLM, all of Hannah House, uh, all those who are, are struggling, Lord, right now. And, and some of them who are just enjoying being safe in the, in the arms of Christ and in the arms of the church. Father, might we continue to be a church where people may find safety in our arms, and God, that they might find Jesus. Lord, we lift up Brother Wayne to you. Father, we lift up Sister Terry. Uh, God, we pray for Hans in the surgery this Friday. May everything go well with it. Lord, may the doctors and the nurses' hands be like the hands of God upon him. Lord, I thank you for Brother Ronnie and all the staff and the helpers of CLM, Lord. Bless them. Father, we lift up uh, Sister Deb to you. God, we lift up uh, Destiny Gaskin, or, or Destiny, Lord, to you. God, that you would be with her and, and guard her as she safely travels back to South Carolina. Uh, Lord, we pray for Joe. Give him safe uh, travels. And Lord, may everything go according to your will. I lift up Brother Keeley to you. I, I lift up Joel. I pray for Dustin. Uh, Lord, thank you that he received you into himself. And Father, for anything that I miss, for anything that I have failed to lift up to you, Lord, you are the God of all. And God, you spoke the world into existence. And so, Father, it's all in your hands. God, be with us as we look at just some amazing passages tonight in one of the most mysterious and powerful uh, books of the Bible. And we ask this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen and amen. If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 11. And uh, just to give you a recap, we have went past the, the seven seals, and uh, we've done pretty much the six trumpets, 
and we are getting very close uh, to that seventh trumpet. And uh, this, this is actually where we're picking up at after uh, the seals. And we're in the trumpets. And chapter 11 of Revelation. And I'm just going to read this chapter in its entirety. You can follow along with me. If anything jumps out to you, just mark it in your mind and we'll look at it. Amen. But it says, uh, yes, sir. No, well, we are in the second woe right now. Amen. So we, we began the first woe. Now we're in the second one. And, uh, and we'll, we're, let's read about this woe. Amen. Amen. Ready, steady. Here we go. Chapter 11, of Revelation. Then I, which is John, was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophecy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and, the stand before, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, Fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. They will have authority to shut the sky so that it does not rain for many days of their prophecy. And they have authority over the waters to turn it into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was what? Crucified. For three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and even exchange presents because the two prophets had been tormented, uh, who had tormented the earth has been killed. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet. And those who saw them were greatly terrified. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. And at that moment there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed, and the third woe is still coming very soon. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there was a loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Then the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, singing, We give you thanks, Lord, God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and began to reign. The nations raged, and your wrath has come, and the time of judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peelings of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Amen. So... Lots of crazy things happen in that passage of Scripture. And uh, to give you some perspective as, as we look at this, uh, most conservative theologians believe that the rapture, and what is the rapture, by the way? What, what is this thing called the rapture? When God uh, zaps his church off the earth, amen, it'd be like we'd all be sitting in here, and in the blink of an eye, like a thief of the night, like... Hopefully, all of us would be gone. Amen? Amen, Danny? Amen. <laughs> like, hopefully, all of us would be gone. But, it, but here's the thing. In, in the, uh, the teaching that Jesus said, there will be two walking along, and then one is gone, and one is there. 
there'll be two ladies working. One is gone, one is there. There'll be two in the bed sleeping. One is gone and one is there. So it gives us this idea that this rapture that happens before the great and trying times occur. And as you've heard me say before, if you could just imagine a world with all innocence and good people gone in one the terror that could cause on the earth. And that's when that first seal is opened. And a man riding a white horse comes in, and he will come as a savior to all of mankind. And what this is, is not Jesus. This is a counterfeit Jesus. This is an antichrist. This is somebody who has the appearance of godliness, but no godliness is within him, and no power of spirit or love dwells in him. And he will come as a conqueror, and then that second seal will be opened, which is the red horse, which will bring war. And then that, uh, that third seal, which is what color? The black will, will be opened, and that will lead to famine. And uh, No, excuse me, that leads to uh, poverty. And this idea that you have to, uh, you, you have, to um, have a lot of money to survive at that point. Or possibly right around this time, unless you have a certain symbol on you, you can only get a certain amount of things. And what, what's that symbol that we know from the Bible? The mark of the beast. We haven't got to that chapter yet, but these are the provisions that are happening. He tells us about the seals first and then the trumpets. But the chapter we're reading right here, chapter 11, are moments that are occurring during the seals. And that's why it can be very confusing reading Revelation because John gives you a perspective of this is happening and then he jumps ahead a little ways and say, look at heaven and look what's happening in heaven. And then he goes back down to earth and says, well, this is what's happening on the earth. And that's the perspective of the seals and the trumpets. But there's something else occurring that needs to be looked at. And there's two forces at work. That's God's people and the enemy's people. Amen. Do we still have those type of people on the earth today? Yeah. Amen. Is there war amongst those people today? And we see this continual fight between darkness and light today. Amen. And so as, as we live in a world like that, uh, these events are very, uh, I would say, very relevant for things that we're even living in right now. And uh, as that fourth seal is open, the diseases happen and people are hurt. And so at that point, many would say right around the fourth seal, these two witnesses appear. That would be around the year four or year three and a half. Because we see in this passage, it says in verse two that uh, it gives us some idea of months here. How many months? And that is people trampling on the holy city. Now, how long is 42 months? Amen. Uh, these are... Uh, approximately uh, two dates, some people look at these two uh, ways. It breaks down in months and days, but these might be two episodes. There will be 142, uh, yes, there, there will be 42 months of when they trample on God's holy city. If you could just imagine the white horse and the red horse coming in and trampling on God's things. And then it shifts and says, I will grant my two witnesses authority over uh, to prophecy for how many days? Uh, yes, 1260. That's the same amount. Why did he say months and then days? Any idea? I mean, why didn't he just keep it at months or keep it at days? Why, why would he do that? This is this so interesting? He's making a distinction. It's both three and a half years. Both those numbers, it's roughly three and a half years. Because we're going to have how long of a tribulation? Seven years. And so if each seal is roughly a year, the witnesses come in halfway. The Antichrist comes in on the first seal. And so they overlap one another. And for three and a half years, these witnesses are preaching during the hardest of times during this sixth seal. Uh, this is when uh, the heavens are pouring down on the earth, that there's meteors, that water turns the blood. And it's also attributed to many of the miracles that these two witnesses are doing. 
And one could uh, surmise that some of these very uh, things, mankind, whether they were doing everything or whether God was doing some and they were doing some, who's going to get the blame for all this bad that's happening? Well, those two witnesses. Amen. And so these two witnesses, they're on the earth for the most important moments of all of earth's history because these are the last few moments before Jesus brings the judgment to the earth. But what does this tell us about God that he would send two witnesses to earth in the darkest time of mankind's timeline? What does this tell us about God? Amen. He still is extending a hand of love to a world that's rejected him. Amen. Uh, we also see that 144,000 are sealed. Amen. Is, is, that, is that correct? They're sealed by God and set apart for him. This, happened dur this happens during the sixth seal. Is it uh, probable or very likely that the preaching and teaching of these witnesses led about to many of those in Jerusalem and in the old school Judea area coming to this new idea of who Jesus really was, why Jesus came to earth, and very importantly, why Jesus is coming back. I mean, what do you think the message of these two witnesses were? What do you think their message was? There's a clear theme in all of Scripture that there's this one word, repent. Repent. Amen? And what we Christians love to throw out is that word revival. I mean, how many of you would love to see a revival? Amen? But listen, that's an Old Testament word. The New Testament word for revival is repent. If we would see some repentance, we would see some revival. Repentance only happens when we change our minds about what, who God is and who God created us to be and what he has called us to do. We must repent, change our minds, change our hearts, turn around and seek him. Amen? Seek his kingdom first and everything else will get in the order. Amen? He's a good God. Now, do you all know what the opposite of repentance is or that word repent Anyone want to uh, guess? What, what's the opposite of repent? We would say rebel, right? Amen. I'm going to throw out some culture at you. Are you all okay with that? I believe the opposite of repent is tolerance. That might get me in trouble. The opposite of repent, I believe, is tolerance. Repent is acknowledging the direction you are going is what? Wrong, and so you turn around. And so you want them to go the right way. Repentance brings them back to yourself, amen, or back to God. Tolerance brings people together, but unchanged. Tolerance teaches that I will love you as you are, and that's acceptable. You see, God, he loves you as you are, but he loves you so much he does not leave you the way you are. His love changes you. You know, before I married Jamie, I was a different person. I was. Before I met her, my mind thought differently. But my wife, she's changed how I think and do. I used to think that salads were awful. I didn't know what to do with a salad. I thought, I was like... What is this green stuff, you know? Uh, if it's not, if it didn't bleed first, I wasn't going to eat it. Amen? If, if it didn't come up out of the ground and it, it was starchy, I didn't want it. Amen? But she gave me these weird ideas that if you eat right, you can live longer. I had never heard of that. I don't know, any of you guys ever struggle with taking care of yourself? But she has really helped shape me and my mind towards that. Not only that, but to have someone in my life, and, and listen, not to be, uh, uh, I guess, too transparent, but every girl that I ever dated before her was not a Christian. I, they, they weren't a Christian. I didn't know how to take that. I didn't. And, and I took it even more of a serious tone, because I was a Christian when I began to date her. 
And I did not want to cross any boundaries that I knew God would not be okay with. And so I had to have this in my mind, and I heard a youth pastor say this, that uh, our bodies are Christ's. And this is what he said. When you're touching your girl, you're touching Jesus. Man, now that really ruined it for me. It really did. That just, that just really that ruined it for me. I was just like, oh, no. Man. Talk about. Stop. Right? And what we fall into the trap of, you know, well, it's my body. No, it's not. Who gave it to you? Who created you and formed you and knew you before the foundations of the world and chose you in love? He did. It says that we were bought with a price, and he paid that price. And so no matter what we do with these temples, they're his. And we should try to take care of ourselves, and we should try to, to, to run. Or I've never seen anybody run and smile. Amen? But some people who are exercising, they're just trying to take care of themselves. And we live in a world that glorifies this outer temple, and we worship it. But this is not forever. You see, we have an internal soul inside of us. That if we work these bodies as best we can, but do not work our souls and do not work our minds, we are deteriorating inside. And what we have is a culture that looks really great, but lacks substance inside. These witnesses, they brought a message of repentance. And people get saved during the tribulation. That is amazing. You know what that means? That it's never too late. Amen. Aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? How many of you, have you got that third chance? Any of you ever get that fourth chance? How about that fifth chance? Aren't you glad that God is a God of chances? Let's not even put a number on it. I mean, we could be right there on the edge of death, and we breathe our last breath, and we just save Jesus. That's extraordinary. How graceful and merciful is the Lord our God that he sent two great witnesses in the darkest hour of mankind and people still get saved. But some crazy stuff happens, doesn't it? This is a wild passage. This is not a time that you would want to live, but a time that you might want to see. Right? Like we love like, watching things on TV or some of us love watching sports. And we'll even say things like, man, we won good this weekend. And when they lose, they're like, man, they lost bad. What do they do with that sentence? They just took themselves right out of it. Amen? And I don't understand that. We did good, and man, we got them good this week. I don't understand that terminology, because you weren't on the field. <laughs> Amen? You were in your living room watching the whole thing. Amen? You weren't out there. But if we're very honest, Many of us Christians, we love watching God work, but we don't want to be a part of his work. Man, isn't God doing just amazing things over there? And God's like, um, would you like to join me? Amen. These two witnesses, they were in it. Amen. They were in the thick of it. And you might say to yourself, well, well, Pastor Chris, God hasn't called me in the thick of it. Listen, you're in the thick of it whether you realize it or not. Any of y'all got a soul here? Because if you don't, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to have a conversation. Amen. <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, as we look at this passage of Scripture, are, are there some questions that are on your mind as we read through this? Because there's some really crazy things happen in this passage of Scripture. Yes, sir. That is so amazing. And this is reminiscent of, just like we've said earlier, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel, he was given a word to eat, and he ate it. John, he was given a word to eat, and he ate it. They both taste like honey. Amen. Listen, the word of God is good. Read it. Amen. And so that's why this is so much more detailed in this manner. When John ate that word... He said at the end of it, now you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And, and that is the knowledge that he obtained from 
from eating the word of God that was given to him. And so while he was uh, given this, in his mind, he was there. He was given this uh, reed to measure with. Now, this is absolutely amazing because as mine is written, it says, come and measure the temple of God. Ezekiel was asked to do the same thing. He measured this temple back and forth. You should check it out. Ezekiel started at like verse, uh, chapter 30 and on. It's, it's quite amazing. But John, he measures the temple and the altar and those who what? Worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it has been given to the nations to trample over the holy city for how long? Three and a half years. That's the first part of the tribulation. And so he is measuring the temple, all right, with this, with this ruler. I don't know how big it is, but could you imagine someone just walking in here and begin measuring the walls and measuring the pews, and then they walk up to you and it's like, hey, you know? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, that would not make me feel good. But you have to understand, that's not what God was asking John to measure when he said measure them. It's a sim symbol of judgment. You know what measures a man? The word of God. That measures us. That's our ruler. This is a, a, a symbolic of the judgment that's coming to not just the world, but also uh, everyone, even God's people in this moment. Take that measuring, but don't measure outside of it. Amen? Just measure what's in there. Because judgment is already coming for those outside of it. And what we really need to do is examine ourselves and make sure that we know the Lord. Amen? That we have received him. Paul said, examine yourselves to see if you pass the test. Amen? Examine your heart. I think the most dangerous prayer David ever prayed was, Lord, search my heart and find if there's any sin there. Whoa, David! I mean, man, if I was a pastor of this church and someone came up to me and it was like, uh, Pastor, I want you to pray this prayer over me. Pray that God can find some sin in my life. Well, sure, brother. Let's, amen. That's, what kind of a prayer that is that? Is that somebody who just wants to get hurt? I mean, what, what kind of a prayer is that? He wants to be held accountable to what God has called him to. And if we're very, we just have to get very serious because it's so easier to look at someone else's calling, to look at someone else's actions, to look at somebody else's life, and we will look at them and strip them down bare bones and judge them and not look at the inside of ourselves and judge ourselves. Judge your temple, amen? Measure it up. See if it measures up to Christ Jesus. We can all use a little co conviction in our lives. Amen? There's a difference between conviction and guilt. And Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians. He wrote such a harsh letter to the Corinthians, to the Corinthians one time. He was basically apologizing. I heard that it caused some conviction. And, and I'm a little sorry about that, but I'm not. <laughs> Amen? Because godly conviction will lead you to where God wants you. But worldly guilt leads to death and sorrow. And those two things still exist. God's Holy Spirit will whisper to you, you were born for so much more. You were created to do way more than this. God, uh, guilt of the enemy will tell you, you can never do better. Guilt from the enemy will always tell you to sit down when God calls you to rise up. Godly conviction will lead you to the flames of his heart, will purify you, and will set you ablaze for him. You'll be a city on a hill. You'll be that candle in the dark. You'll be the light that he's called you to be. You'll be that lampstand. You'll be that olive tree. And these are the two witnesses that God called in the darkest of time to stand out as lampstands and as olive trees to bring the light. And sometimes that's all we need in our life is someone to bring a little light to us. Amen? How many of y'all was ever confronted by somebody 
and they like shine that light for you, and then you're like, turn that light out. <laughs> Have you ever done that? I'm, I'm talking spiritually, but we can be, talk like, do you all remember back in the day when you, when, you're, when you had a substitute teacher? And every time you had a substitute teacher, you know what they always do? Let's watch a video. Yeah. Amen? Because you weren't going to learn anyway. Amen? And unless you had a really good one, right? And so they play a video, and they turn the light out. And halfway through, you're almost sleeping. And then, for whatever reason, they just flip that light back on. And it's so bright that your brain almost explodes. Have you ever been there? I had this really kind substitute teacher. I, I can't remember his name, but he was so kind. And p kids were so mean to him. But he was so kind. He would always write a good letter about the class. And we're just like, man, he lied. We were, <laughs> we were awful, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, but uh, <laughs> and, um, before he would turn the light out, he would always say this. Now close your eyes real tight because I'm going to turn the light on. So we could adjust to it. Amen. Some of us, we want to adjust to the light. But if we're honest, some of us have never opened our eyes. Because if we had opened our eyes, we would see what the light is shining on. We would see what the Word says. You know, I was telling somebody, me as a pastor, I never have to have an opinion. I just lean upon God's Word. That's it. That's the only place I ever need to stand is God's Word. I don't need an opinion. I have His truth. The truth. There's no perception. It's just his. And I'm his. And once I get that perspective down, I understand what it means to, to just give and live and to be light. These um, witnesses in the Greek, that word witness is martyr. Have you ever heard of that word martyr? What do we usually use that word for to describe? Martyr. Amen. Someone who dies, who gives their life for the cause. Amen. And that is where we get that word. It does not mean someone who dies. Martyr actually means witness. Someone who bears the truth. That's what a martyr is. And there are some who actually will bear the truth unto death. Jesus emptied himself, taking it on the mantle of a servant. Amen? Even willing to die for us. I, uh, how many of you, we got some married couples here tonight? Any married couples? How many of y'all are like in that dating stage? You're like, I still kind of like them. Amen? You're in the dating stage, you know. And I, I ask, like, even in, like, uh, marriage counseling situations, I ask, you know, and I'll get very serious. I'm like, would you die for this woman? You know, nine times out of ten, the man even sits up a little bit, like he's going to come at me, you know. <laughs> Just like nine times out of ten. Now, listen, I'm not real strong, but I'm very fast, right? I'm very fast. But they'll just sit halfway up and he goes, you know I will. <laughs> and I said, well, are you going to do those dishes too? <laughs> you know what they do? And then they sit back down. <laughs> you know, that's what they do, man. They just sit right back down. Amen. You going to take that garbage out too, brother? Because it's real easy to say you'll die for something when you can say it. But it's a completely different scenario when you're looking at the executioner. That's why Jesus said, be faithful in the little things, and you'll be faithful in the big things. And if us men would crave to look upon God's word more than anything else on this planet, I mean, what kind of world would we live in? It'd be quite beautiful, I, I think. Christians, we are in the nitty-gritty. We are in the times of persecution, of brother against brother, 
of house against house, of nation against nation. We are living in times of biblical proportions, and the thing that we really need to get straight is our hearts. We need to measure our hearts to God's word. These witnesses, they came at the darkest hour. I don't know what valley you're walking through. You might be on a hilltop right now, and praise God that you're on the hilltop right now. But there are some of us who are in the trenches and in the dark. There are some of us who are struggling, still trying to figure out what does all this mean being a Christian. Amen. What are we going to do? I like that. Ginger said, we're going to pray. Amen. You know, I believe many more people pray than the world thinks. You know what's one of the first prayers God hears? The prayer of a sinner. Amen. The prayers of those who are far from him. The prayers of those who don't even think he's listening. He hears you. He knows you. He loves you. So when you go through your battles and the things that you feel are going to tear you from the inside out and break you completely, just remember who hemmed you in. Amen? Just remember who gives you a place to stand. And you can always stand on him. He'll give you that foundation. These witnesses came in power and might... Who do y'all think these witnesses were? Who, who do you think these witnesses were? Yes? Your footnote. <laughs> no, I'm just picking, man. Uh, but yeah, what, what, what's it say? So, most theologians believe that it is Elijah and Moses. And I just want to preface this that I believe it's them too. I, I do. There are other theories out there. There are theories that are more direct and, and, and less, um, what I would say, um, people trying to be too smart, amen, and not look for the word as what it is. But there are some who believe that these are the last two churches on the earth, and they represent churches. And then another uh, theory is that it's Elijah and Enoch. And the reason why they say it's Enoch is because Enoch walked with God and was no more. Amen. And he was taken. And then Elijah, we know what happened to him. Amen. God picked him up on the coolest ride ever. A flaming chariot drawn with flaming horses. Now, what a way to go out. Amen. It's 2020, and I'm still waiting on my flying cars. Amen. And this guy, he was way ahead of his time. He had a, a flaming chariot pick him up. And so these two never tasted death is what most theologians argue about, because it's appointed that all men must what? Must die. And so we're like, oh, no, no one's going to get through that loophole there. They're going to experience death. The only problem with, with that is the scenario of the entire Bible, because Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. When Jesus led Peter, James, and John up on top of a hill, and they called the Mount of Transfiguration, and while they were up on there, and this is really neat, because somehow they knew it was who with Jesus. Moses and Elijah. You know what that tells me? In heaven, we won't have to have name tags. Amen? We see in a mirror dimly lit, but when the complete comes, all things will be revealed. And so they knew that this was Elijah. They knew that this was Moses. And Peter wanted to build them shacks to live up there forever. Amen? And God was just like, hush, Peter, you know? I wish God would tell us that sometimes. Hush, man. Amen. Stop talking. But I'll tell you this. It fits with the scenario because the prophets that can't come during the tribulation, they make fire come down from heaven. Well, who did that? Elijah. Moses was led by a pillar of fire at the night. Amen. They turned the water into blood. Well, who did that? Moses. And here's something very intriguing. The letter of Jude mentions this mysterious thing that the archangel Michael 
and the devil had a dispute over wh whose body? Moses' body. Well, why would they have a dispute unless the Lord had need of it? Amen? Very interesting stuff. But here's what I want to leave with you. Regardless of who these witnesses are, here's where we always make the mistake. We put too much emphasis on the messenger and not enough on the message. Look at the message. Always look at Jesus. That's why I try to hide behind Jesus, everybody. We need to hide behind him. He's got to be up front. Too, mo too many of us want to put ourselves in front of Jesus, and that is not to be done. He is the reason for us being here in this moment. And so we must look to the message, always to the message. And the message that they were giving, I believe, was repent, for the Lord is returning. Amen? And he was. And at this moment, they are, uh, and this is rough. What happens to them after their days of profiting are done? They are killed by what? What does it say in your translation? It says, once that they had finished, the beast comes up from where? The bottomless pit. Will make war on them and conquer and kill them. You know what's really sad is when the enemy thinks he's won. You know what's sad is when you think you win, but you lost. Any of you men ever won an argument with your wife? You lost. Amen. You know, there, there's times in our lives where we think we've won, but we've lost. And, and, and listen, if you think you've won this world, you've lost. Jesus said, and Peter and Paul writes things like this, those who love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. That's rough, isn't it? Because if you're working for this world and this reward, you're going to be very, very sad because all this will be gone. Amen. We're just passing through. Amen, brothers. These uh, prophets, they are killed, but three and a half days later. I think this is the, the most understated verse of the Bible because the world watches this happen. Like all nations, all people of different tribes and languages, all of them see this happen. You know, a hundred years ago, People would have read this and said, wow, it was a miracle that everyone could see this in one moment. Christians, are we not living in days where everybody can see one moment live? We are living in quite amazing times. The world saw all of this happen live and in their time, and three and a half days later. During this time, they're celebrating, they're reveling, they're even trading parties. They are celebrating the death of of people. Isn't it crazy that we're living in a time that people not even uh, glorify sin, but they rejoice in those who are partaking in it? Aren't we living in those days? They're rejoicing at the death of these men, and in three and a half days, they get up. And it says that they were greatly terrified. I think that's an understatement. Could you imagine? And in this day and age, if people saw that, Oh, that's <laughs> can't you like imagine like some people are like looking at us, oh that's that's that must be doctored. That must be the people there who saw it was right there. What does it say in the Bible that they do? That those who saw it happen. Amen. And it says that they heard a voice. What did it say? Come up here. And at that moment there was a great earthquake. Amen. A tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were terrified and did what? Gave glory to God of heaven. I want to ask you a very theological question. Are those who bowed down at that moment and gave glory to God in heaven, I want to ask you a question. Do you think that they made it? Do you think they went to heaven? It doesn't say they repented. They just said, wow, your glory. And here's, we don't know, we don't know. This is a theological question. 
Because I believe in the mercy of God completely. But here's the thing. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But check this out. Not everybody is going to make it. Even the demons and the king of demons will bow his knee and confess with his tongue. But it, at that point, it's what? Too late. They are experiencing the judgment. Now, Christians, we don't need to worry so much about them. What I am most concerned with is you, your heart, where you stand with God. What are you talking to him about? What is he working in your life regarding? Because no one can walk your walk. No one can grow your faith. No one else can receive the Lord for you and be saved for you or in some denominations or, bat or uh, cults be baptized in your name. That's, that's no. This is a personal relationship with the God who died for you. And what we've learned in Scripture is that miracles, they don't save anybody. The Israelites, they saw all those wonders in Egypt. They saw ten wonders. They get to the wilderness, and what do they do? They sin and sin and sin and disobey and disobey. Amen. God gave them manna from heaven, and they said, this is nasty. Isn't that us? Amen. That's us. Miracles are wonderful. But I'll tell you this, and many of you may have even said this, well, I'll make a decision when I see God do something awesome. Well, I'll make a move when I see an amazing miracle. I'll make a move. Listen, the miracle might be the change in your heart. I think what we want to see is the miraculous. And we, we, what we don't understand is the miraculous is your salvation. And our reward is always him. He's our reward. Lord Jesus, I'm working towards you. And every obstacle that I meet, I'm going to go around it or climb underneath it or dig under it. I don't care what it takes, Lord Jesus. My goal is you. No matter tragedy that happens, whatever hurt, I, and whatever loss I take, my reward is you. You're the one I'm heading to. And everything else that we face in life, it's just bonus. The people that we come across, the relationships that we make, the, the memories that we make, that's just bonus. At the end of the day, it's Him. But how are you? I love you so much. Sometimes I think some pastors just want to stand up and say, sin is bad. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Love Jesus, do good. You know, we just want to keep it so simple. And that's what Jesus did. He, he did. He kept it so simple. He said that I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And here's the mystery. <laughs> is he looked at a bunch of broken people who were always told they were not good enough. And he said, you are the light of the world. You are my witnesses in all the earth. And he gives us a power that comes from the living God. The same spirit that split the Red Sea lives in his people. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in his people. Are you his people? You know what's amazing? Is we never know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Amen? I love how God, he, he doesn't leave a stone unturned because at the end of this section, and this is the end of the tribulation and the beginning of glory, John gives us a small glimpse, and then later he gives us an even greater glimpse at the end of Revelation, but he gives us a small glimpse at the end of all things here, and it says that the 24 elders worshipped him, and at the very bottom it says in verse 19, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of the covenant, his covenant, was where? It was seen in his temple in heaven. You know, have you ever seen some of those documentaries on where did the Ark of the Covenant go? You know, and there's, there's so many interesting theories. It's in heaven. That's, that's what the Bible says. It's in heaven. Amen. And it gives a closure to the people of God 
his chosen people Israel. Because God's presence departed from them. The temple, all, the temple and the Ark of the Covenant, or the mercy seat of God, always represented his presence. Amen? And God took his presence away from them. You know what this means in this passage of Scripture? My presence is with you. My presence is here. That God is with you. Do you know that? That he's with you. That he really said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe that? Because there's many things that we leave and forsake on this earth. But I promise you, God will never do that to you. Amen? He will never do that to you. He's with you to the end. Uh, church, uh, that's, that's so much. But any other questions or anything? Anything that I did not cover or you were thinking about during this passage of Scripture? Yeah. A day matters. Joe, that's so poetic. Does your brothers in Christ know you're that poetic? And uh, but that's the point. It's like when you before you knew Christ, man, what was a day to you? Amen. But with the Lord, Amen, a day means much more. And to him, like a day is how long? A thousand years, amen. Listen, days are important. I believe structurally, John did that so that there be no mistake of the difference between the times because they equal the same amount of time. And he's given us what happens before the witnesses come and what happens when the witnesses come. And we are living in the time of being a witness, a martyr. I'm not asking any of y'all to go out and die for your faith. I'm just asking you to shine your light. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yeah. How many of y'all have just had a day where you're just like, well, I blew that one. Yeah. <laughs> right? Amen. Uh, I think we've all had days like that. What else? Uh, what are questions or anything that might not have hit? Um, so this is the perspective of the witnesses versus the enemy. Well, the next two chapters we read is just going to be about the enemy. And it's so very interesting that we get to, to look at it. He gives us different points of view in this revelation. And then after we get past that, we will really begin to watch the crescendo of the great return that is Jesus. Amen. Uh, and there's, there's two types of Christians out there. Wait a little longer, Jesus. And there are some, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. You know, don't look down on those wait a little longer, Jesus, people. Because I feel like most of them have some family that they desperately want to know Christ. Amen. I'm one of them people. I got people I love. Amen. Amen. We, we have people we love. And we want them to know Christ. Amen. We do. Uh, anything else? Any other questions or, or comments or anything? All right. Well, amen. I love you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, CLM, everybody. Give them a hand, man. Very cool stuff, man. Amen. And uh, y'all keep uh, Joel in your prayers as he's preparing his testimony uh, that God will use it and God will use him as he graduates from the ministry. And uh, we love all you men so much. Uh, even James Riffle, amen. And we, we love you, brother. <laughs> he smiled a little bit, everybody. I like that. Amen. If you would, won't you stand up and let us uh, go to Lord in prayer.
Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much. You were the first witness, God, because you presented yourself to Adam. And Lord, some of us might even be boastful and say the Christian church is the second witness. No. You sent Jesus. And he was that witness of your goodness. And then some of us might say, well, we're that third. No, we're not even the third witness. He sent the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit still testifies and shines the light of Christ. And Lord, all those who call upon your name will have that spirit that lives in them. Lord, let every person depart here tonight with that Holy Spirit. And it just comes at this, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. We ask all this in your precious name. All God's people say, amen. Thank you all.